Uh, the first thing I want to say to us, uh, say to everybody tonight is we have a link in the chat box down below. Uh, the Archaeological Institute of America is running a sale on membership, and there's really quite a reasonable uh, uh, rate for membership in the society. Uh, and um, I guess the thing, the thing I would say, especially to those of you who might be students, uh, membership in the AIA is really a, a great way, not just to sort of um, learn about the world of professional archaeology and also the sort of world of um, uh, uh, archaeology as an interest, uh, but it's also a way to become eligible for a variety of different opportunities, including uh, scholarships and fellowships uh, and uh, fieldwork opportunities. So I would kind of recommend uh, checking that out if you are a student. And of course, if you're not a student, uh, it's one of the oldest, um, it is the oldest uh, organization supporting archaeology in the United States. They publish a great magazine, uh, Archaeology Magazine. Uh, there really are a lot of benefits to membership. Um, so now let's do a little bit of mechanics before we get started. Uh, I just want to say that we're going to keep everybody on mute just because there's so many of us here tonight. Uh, this is a very exciting thing for our, our, our uh, society, I think, to be able to uh, make the best of uh, the COVID situation and have an online lecture like this. This is really very exciting to have this many people coming out tonight. Um, so we're going to we'll keep everybody on mute for now. And then after the talk is over, I would ask if you have questions, if you could please post your questions into the chat room. Uh, and uh, I believe Michael Callahan is going to be our sort of MC for taking those, fielding those questions and posing them uh, to our speaker. All right, so I would love to introduce our speaker. Our speaker this evening is Nancy Gonlin, Dr. Nancy Gonlin, who's a Mesoamerican archaeologist. Uh, she studies ancient Maya commoners, among many other things. She studies ancient Maya commoners and their daily and nightly lives. Uh, Dr. Gonlin earned her PhD from uh, Pennsylvania State University, and she teaches at Bellevue College in Bellevue, Washington, which I looked on a map. I think it's about as far as you can get from uh, Orlando and still be in the continental <laughs> United States. So uh, uh, we're very happy to have her uh, with us tonight. We're uh, sad. I, it is kind of a perverse thing to say, but we're sad that she didn't have to fly all the way across uh, the continent to be with us. Uh, uh, she's Dr. Gonlin's a remarkably re productive scholar, and I was just going to highlight a few of her authored and edited books. She co-edited a, bo edited a book called Archaeology of the Night, Life After Dark in the Ancient World. Uh, she uh, co-edited a book called Human Adaptation in Ancient Mesoamerica, Empirical Approaches to Mesoamerican Archaeology. Um, Ancient Households of the Americas, Conceptualizing What Households Do. And then a uh, uh, this is a fascinating title to me, Commoner Ritual and Ideology in Ancient Mesoamerica. Uh, and she's also co-authored a, a book called Copan, The Rise and Fall of an Ancient Maya Kingdom. Uh, and in a, uh, to give you an idea of her status within the field, she's the new editor-in-chief of Ancient Mesoamerica, one of the um, uh, largest and most prestigious uh, journals in uh, New World Archaeology. Uh, it's entirely appropriate that we're hearing from her uh, via a Zoom lecture because, at least from my understanding, Dr. Gollins really uh, seems like she's really at the forefront of bringing anthropology to a larger audience in this kind of way. She's a contributor to an excellent online anthropology magazine and podcast called Sapiens. Um, that's a great outfit. They do all kinds of neat things, and some of her work has appeared there in that online magazine. Uh, you can also watch her TED Talk. You can just uh, Google... Uh, Ted and Nancy Gonlin, and you will find it. Um, uh, I think I've gone on long enough. Uh, our speaker is Nancy Gonlin. Her topic tonight is Light in Darkness, Illuminating the Classic Maya World. Dr. Gonlin. Thank you for that lovely introduction, John, and thank all of you for coming this evening. It's still afternoon here in the Northwest, so I'm enjoying this time at 4 p.m. instead of 7 p.m. your time. I appreciate your sharing your evening with me. Let me share the screen here and get that going. Can everyone see this screen? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. Yeah, there we go. 
Okay, this is the Archaeological Institute of America, the Nadia Borowski Lectures, and I am honored to be selected for this lecture that is funded by Nadia Borowski, and I thank the institution also for this opportunity to share my material with you. The Archaeological Institute of America has a national lecture program, and this is one of the many, many lectures that they offer. So we make archaeology happen, and we have since 1879. The AIA is North America's largest and oldest organization with over 200,000 members worldwide. We support archaeologists, educators, excavations, publications, research, and site preservation. Our programs and publications keep you up to date with archaeological discoveries and research from around the world. Read all about it in our engaging publications, Archaeology Magazine with a readership of over 700,000 per issue includes in-depth stories, archeological highlights from around the world and spectacular images that bring the past to vivid life. This really is one of my favorite publications in the world of archeology. span I highly recommend it as well as the American Journal of Archaeology, which is the world's leading journal of Mediterranean archeology. span Dig in and experience archaeology with the AIA, attend a lecture, an archaeology fair, or other local event organized by the AIA, our local societies or collaborating organizations. Find an excavation on our extensive list of fieldwork opportunities and visit spectacular archaeological sites around the world with AIA tours. Join the AIA and indulge your passion for archaeology. Become a part of the adventure today. Uncover the past and experience the thrill of discovery. And enjoy exclusive member benefits. And as you know, that was announced, there is a discount on membership. So I highly recommend joining this society if you're not already a member. Support the AIA and make archaeology possible. As a nonprofit, we rely on the generosity of donors to support our mission. Your gift makes archaeological research, site preservation, publications, and programs possible. So this lecture is being recorded so that everyone knows, and it will be available on the YouTube video. So I'd like to start my talk, Light and Darkness, Illuminating the Classic Maya World. The world of archaeology knows me as Nan Gonlin. I also go by Nancy, though, and I teach at Bellevue College in Washington State. Just a brief outline. I'll talk about the late classic lowland Maya, briefly go over theoretical orientations for studying this topic, and then we need to talk about evidence for illumination and then the symbolism of that illumination. I'll touch on the significance of the studies and some brief conclusions. Okay, the late classic lowland Maya. Let me get my highlighter here. They occupied this area the, um, from AD 600 to 900 is probably the best known time period of the classic Maya, although you have Maya who existed long before that, and certainly you have millions of descendants of Maya people living today. So the green area is the lowland Maya area, the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico, uh, Chiapas and the Peten, you've got Belize here, the modern country of Belize, Guatemala, into Honduras and also El Salvador includes the Maya area. These are just a few of the sites in the Maya region. Uh, this is a photograph of Caracol, uh, generously donated to me from Arlen and Diane Chase. Here we've got a stela or a stone monolith at the site of Quiregua in Guatemala. This is Copan, Honduras, the ball court there, and Uxmal in the Yucatan Peninsula and then Palenque in Chiapas, Mexico. So if you look at these photographs, these are ancient Maya cities that were photographed during the daytime when lighting is not necessary in the bright tropics. 
I'll focus mainly on two sites, Copan, Honduras, and then Hoya de Seren in El Salvador. These are very two different sites. Copan is more of a typical kind of archaeology in the sense that you've got large monumental remains in the classic Maya region. And then Hoya de Seren is the remains of a farming community that was covered by volcanic ash with absolutely extraordinary preservation. So let's look at Copan, Honduras very briefly. This is the main group, or sometimes it's called the principal group. So you can see that there's a great plaza and temples, uh, palaces. You've got the hieroglyphic stairway, which is the longest inscription of Maya hieroglyphs in the classic Maya world. And then this is a reconstruction of what perhaps the city looked like. If you look at uh, these buildings, they probably were painted in bright red or white. White is the plaster. So when you look at ancient re ruins, you should keep in mind that they weren't just the stone color that you see today, but they very well might have been very, very brightly colored. And then you've got some communities, uh, suburbs around the main core. Copan was ruled by a dynasty of 16 kings that lasted about 400 years. In 426, the founder, Kinich Yashkokmo, came to Copan from Teotihuacan. Pictured on this altar, this is altar Q at Copan, are four of the kings, and this is the last ruler, Yashpasa Chanyopat, who ruled from 763 to 810. Altar Q also on the other sides pic picture the other rulers, but this baton of office is being passed from the very first ruler to the very last ruler. When we look at Hoya de Seren in El Salvador, the occupation here was very abruptly terminated in AD 660. The Loma Caldera eruption covered all of this site and really an entire area around this site. This site was actually found quite by accident by archeologist Payson Sheets of the University of Colorado. And I was so honored to be able to work at this site in 2013 with him and his crew. So what we have here are the remains of houses that were built of wattle and daub with thatched roofs that are preserved exactly as they were 15, 1400 years ago. It is absolutely incredible. If you ever get the chance to visit here, it is a moving sight to see. You have kitchens, you've got kitchen gardens, you've got uh, houses where people live, the domiciles, you've got storehouses. And then what's really interesting is that you have public buildings at this site. Here's a political center that was built you have a sweat bath, a feasting center, and then a diviner structure. So there is some unique architecture here. When I talk about theoretical orientations for studying darkness and light and night and day, this is kind of a laundry list of different orientations that people have used. And it's not necessarily exclusive, but I just want to briefly point out some of the different theoretical orientations so that you as a researcher or a student know that there's not just one way to look at the past or this particular subject that I'm talking about tonight. The anthropology of luminosity has everything to do with how people manipulate light. How do we use it in various cultural settings? Sensory archeology span brings in not only our sight, which of course as primates is dominant for us, but also sound and taste and smell and touch. In other words, what was it like to sense the past and to actually be in the past as someone who lived during that time, uh, you know, 1500 years ago or so. Agency theory has everything to do with individual choice and how people make decisions and how that impacts the archaeological record. Some of you might be familiar with practice theory, and Pierre Bordeaux's name is intricately associated with this particular outlook. And if you think about what you do on a daily basis, your habits, for example, 
This has everything to do with practice theory. What are your practices, daily practices? And then I flip that and change that into nightly practices. Environment behavior studies, sometimes called EBS, comes from Amos Rapoport, who is an architect. And he studies how the environment shapes our interactions and then how we shape the environment for our interactions. Cultural and historical ecology have everything to do with human environment relations and how the environment affects us, how we affect the environment. Some of you might be familiar with cultural astronomy. You know what astronomy is, the study of the stars and the planets and astronomical bodies. If you think about how different cultures perceive astronomy, that's what this has to do with. What kinds of features in the night sky are important to different people around the world today and in the past? The archaeology of the night, I'll talk about a little bit more in depth in just a moment, but that is a perspective that I created. And then nighttime household archaeology goes along with the archaeology of the night that I will also delve into a little bit more in just a moment. So the anthropology of luminosity. Mikkel Bill and Tim Flores Sorensen wrote a, an article, a journal article in 2007, and they talked about how light has agency. And to quote them, an examination of how light is used socially to illuminate places, people, and things, and hence affect the experiences and materiality of these in culturally specific ways. How light as matter in itself may be manipulated and used in social and material practices. So after reading their article, I was energized to investigate this topic as it pertains to the classic Maya. In case you don't know, there is an international lichnological association. And quite frankly, I had no idea what lichnology is until I started researching this. And lichnology is the study of pre-modern light and lighting devices. So there's an entire society that is dedicated to such studies. Archaeology of the night is a focus on nocturnal aspects of a culture and the role of night in ancient societies. I am uh, currently co-editing a volume with my colleague, David Reed, and our publication will come out next year. And David defined night ways. This is his definition. The cross-disciplinary study of nocturnal customs, behaviors, habits, and items of a group of people to understand the anthropological complexity of nicthemeral practices. Nightways deal with the interconnected ideas, values, formalized behaviors, and material objects that are organized and reenacted via the performance of social roles and tasks related to the experiences of the night. So you can see that illumination is intricately connected to night and darkness. And the other aspect about this is we do aim for cross-disciplinary study. So if you're interested in any aspect of archeology, span this is a great way to think about the night when whatever um, area that you are researching. Now in nighttime archeology, span nighttime household archeology span is something that I came up with. Household archeology span is the study of the remains of the household, you don't dig up a household, you dig up the houses in which people live. And the household is the smallest corporate unit within a culture. So if you think that, where did most pe people spend their nights? Most people spend their nights at home. And if you tie this in with practice theory, then you can think of, well, if people are spending most of their nights at home, then the archeological signatures of those habits and practices should be visible to us. So this is what nighttime household archeology span is all about. There are recent publications on the night and darkness. In 2016, 
Uno Noche de Espanto by Jacques Galinier was published. This is a cultural anthropology ethnography by him, as well as Las Cosas de la Noche, Una Marada Diferente by Aurora Manod Becalin and Jacques Galinier. And then in 2016, you have the Archaeology of Darkness, which was an edited volume that came out by Dowd and Hensi. In 2018, I have a co-edited volume that was published on the Archaeology of the Night. And this is the book that I was talking about with David Reed, Night and Darkness in Ancient Mesoamerica. So that is in production and will be published next year. I have um, an article that was just released in this book, Rethinking Darkness, Cultures, History, and Practices. And this is not only cross-cultural, but it's cross-disciplinary. And this was put together by two British geographers, Nick Dunn and Tim Edensor, who invited me and my co-editor, April Noel, to contribute. And then in 2022, I will have another edited volume coming out after Dark, the Nocturnal Urban Landscape and Lightscape of Ancient Cities. And I'm co-editing co this volume with Megan Strong, who is not only a lichnologist, but she is an Egyptologist as well. So some very exciting publications that are already available. Now, evidence for illumination. What were ancient people doing at night that required illumination? Weren't they all sleeping? When I talk about this in my class with students, they say, well, ancient people didn't do anything at night. It was too dark. Here you have a classic Maya bench, a stone bench. This would have been plastered over. Here you have a Maya woman sleeping there, dreaming about cacao. This is a cacao tree. I would be dreaming about chocolate too. And with Halloween coming up, I'm definitely dreaming about chocolate. I bought some Halloween candy just in case we have trick-or-treaters, but if we don't, I think I'll manage. So what were people doing at night? You can think about this question and then we'll talk about it. There's evidence the world over for lighting devices from the Paleolithic. This is a Paleolithic stone lamp and animal fat was put in there to light, especially in caves. And then you have uh, in ancient Egypt, this is a, a wick on stick kind of light. This is actually the wick on stick light that was found in the tomb of King Tutankhamun. And then over to ancient Rome, you have clay pots that were filled with oil as well that served as lighting devices. And then to the new world, back to the Greenland area of the Vikings and their um, stone kind of lamps that they've manufactured as well for lighting. So actually there's a lot of evidence all over the world for lighting devices. If we talk about lighting, one thing that we need to do is to discuss sources of natural illumination, and that's the sun and the moon. Day and night is one of the most basic cycles observed in astronomy and certainly observed by humans on a daily basis. So our daily rhythm, which we probably don't even think about, is illuminated in different ways. Uh, the sun, there are lots of architects who purposely de design buildings according to how the sun is going to affect the position of the rooms. And then at night, of course, we often don't build buildings according to how the moon is going to shine in, but it can have an effect. As you know, there are different phases of the moon from new to waxing crescent to the first quarter uh, onto the full moon. And if you look at where we are uh, today, we are waxing gibbous and we're almost at a full moon. There's a full moon tomorrow for Halloween. Isn't that quite a coincidence? So just keep in mind these different phases of the moon. One of my colleagues, Kristen Landau, who is also a Mesoamerican archaeologist, studied with Anthony Avini at Colgate, and she is, he is one of the most uh, well-known cultural astronomers. So she looked at the number of accessions that kings acceded to the throne in, uh, during classic times, and she correlated with the lunar day and the lunar phases. 
So there were 11 different sites with 83 accession dates. And interestingly, what she found is that most of the accession dates occur on either a full moon, as you can see here, or else a new moon. So not only did the classic Maya kings, many of whom took within their names Kanish, which means uh, the sun, but they subscribe to lunar power as well. And lunar power is also connected with agriculture. There are lots of agricultural practices even today that state that you should plant certain plants during certain phases of the moon. If you look at the farmer's almanac in the United States, there are recommendations like that. There's lots of portable illumination that was used in the past. And one form of that illumination is the torch, as is pictured here on this particular vase. And in case you don't know this, there's something called the Maya Vase Database run by Justin Kerr. So whenever you see a classic Maya Vase, this is a rollout of it, what it would look like if you're looking, turning it 3D. And this is the Justin Kerr number or the K number, in this case, K1214. So if you look at the torches that are being held, it looks like there's some kind of handle. And in fact, ceramic handles were made to hold the pine torches so that people didn't get splinters in their hands or that they didn't burn themselves. So sometimes these ceramic handles are actually recovered. It's not so common that we find the torches themselves though. Now there are nocturnal rituals that were made possible by the torch and the light of the moon. This is a famous lintel, lintel 24 on structure 13 at a site of Yashilan in Mexico. Here we have Lady Shook, and we know her name because it says so in the hieroglyphs. And she's engaging in a bloodletting ritual with her husband, King Shield Jaguar. King Shield Jaguar is holding a torch here, as you can see, and this certainly has a handle attached to it. And what she is doing is pulling a thorn line, um, thorn line rope through her tongue. And the blood is dripping down into this bowl here that's lined with bark paper. The bark paper will then be burned to honor the ancestors. Nighttime was an ideal time to commune with ancestors. This is when they were out and about. Now on this particular date, AD 709, October 24th, which is recorded in the hieroglyphs, we know that there was a waxing gibbous moon that provided 90% illumination. So it's highly likely that this date was so auspicious. It was chosen because of the moon and also because of the darkness um, that it provided. You obviously need a torch here. And whether this occurred inside of a building or outside is unknown, but nevertheless, um, this was an event that needed to be illuminated by the torch. There's a lot of nocturnal politicking that happened in the palace, at least as recorded on these vases. Now, granted, keep in mind that this is a painting on a vase that shows a reconstruction of what some palace scene might have looked like. Here you have the ruler, and he's sitting on a bench. And here you have the subjects in front of him. Perhaps they have brought him some offerings. And look at the two individuals who are holding torches. This man here is holding a torch, and then this man here is also holding a torch. So we know the torches played an important role, and we know that some of these events that occurred in the palace happened at night. Trying, there we go, whoops, wrong way, sorry. Now, I want you to look at this scene again and think about power of shadows. Examine the palace scene and where would shadows be cast and upon whom? If you look at this individual, he's highlighting these two people 
and putting the flame over them so that the ruler can see them clearly. Whereas the ruler is backlit so that the light is not in his eyes and that these people would not be able to see him as clearly. So this ruler is manipulating light on purpose. And that's a form of power. Now at Piedras Negras, another classic Maya site, there was this famous panel that was called Panel 3. It was carved in AD 783, and it's kind of a retrospective history because it really celebrates the 20th anniversary of a ruler there in AD 749. But what this ruler records on this panel is that there was midnight dancing and imbibing of an inebriating cacao drink. That would work for me. So you can see the importance of these, um, not only rituals at night, but at an auspicious hour of midnight. Now, if you're going to dance the night away, this requires some kind of lighting. There are lots of sites, uh, Copan is one of them, for example, that has a platform for dancing, and this is structure 25. This dance platform is very smoothed over. It was so used so often that the plaster hair here had to be um, put on several times. And this is in the East Court. You have two jaguar figures here. These are dancing jaguars. And of course, jaguars are creatures of the night. You have one that was here and one that was here. And we know that dancing took place um, what was found around this platform were large stone sensors that probably lit up the night. So while we have the dance platform, you also need some source of light. So it's possible that torches or the sensors were placed around the particular plant platform here, and that's how people could dance the night away. Dance and kingship are intricately connected. Kings were supposed to do certain dances. And there's a delightful book that Matt Looper has written about dancing and classic Maya kingship. Deer hunting was also done at, tor at night by torches. And if you think of the saying uh, deer in the headlights, these would have been deers in the torchlight. And it would be much easier to see them and also to corral the deer at night by using torches. You can imagine if the classic Maya had uh, road signs that perhaps this is what one might have looked at uh, deer ahead, just as we have the deer sign. And this is uh, from a classic Maya vase of a deer hunting that was successful. You see the hunter here carrying the deer on his back. So we know that deer were used for hunting because of the depictions on ceramic vases from classic times and into uh, contemporary times. For example, Charles Wisdom, who studied the Chorti Maya in the 1930s and 40s, wrote about how classic Maya, excuse me, wrote about how contemporary Maya hunted deer at night using torches. Torches and caves. When you go into a cave, this automatically creates darkness at any time of the day. And this particular cave is one that I explored. And this one is actually in um, Puebla, Mexico, and not in the Maya region. But in many, many caves, you can find remains of torches and the handles that were used for them, as well as offerings. Caves are the portals to the underworld. They are extremely important to many people around the world, and ex especially so to the classic Maya. So burning question, did the ancient Maya make candles? I wasn't sure the answer to this, so I had to do a lot of investigating and talk to a number of epigraphers and iconographers who helped me to resolve this question. Interestingly, at the site of Seren, where you have this exceptional preservation of materials, uh, just to give you some idea, these are the adobe walls of the house. And inside the house, this is a storage bin for maize, for corn. All of these pots were found in situ in their original position. 
And then on this divider wall, high on the top, uh, just above the doorway, some beeswax was found. I talked to Payson Sheets who excavated this structure. And he said that this is a ball of beeswax about the size of a baseball. And he wasn't sure for what it was used. So we know that the Maya definitely had beeswax. You can make candles out of beeswax, but did they? What we found at Seren or what Payson found at Seren is miniature pots. Now to me, when I saw these miniature pots, they look like candle holders. We also find from the site of Copan, candeleros, which look like this. Some of them are brightly painted. These ones, uh, particular ones are not though. And if you look at the size and shape of them, they're quite small and they look like little candle holders. So I'm thinking, did the Maya make candles or not? Well, according to the Florentine Codex, which was a um, colonial document in the 1500s by Bernardino de Sahagun, here he depicts a candle maker during Aztec times, colonial times. But this is a um, person who is wearing more of a Spaniard, Spanish outfit and making candles from tallow rather than beeswax. And if we go back to the other slide, when you think about the remains of wax, and if you've ever burnt candles, you know how sometimes the wax goes into the candle holder. I talked to uh, Jennifer Loffmiller Cardinal, who examines residue on pots. And she told me that the issue with examining candeleros, which in Spanish means candle holder, is that most of these candeleros are washed. So it would, the any residues would be washed away. So she is actually investigating that now with some candeleros that were not washed. So I don't have the answer for you, but it's not likely that the classic Maya made candles. And given the name, this is a candle macaque, which is um, an Anahuatl or Aztec name for a candle maker. It's a combination of a Spanish name with um, a Nahuatl name that's put together. So probably not, but I really had to investigate that since I was thinking about luminosity among the classic Maya. Now, if we look at clay forms, we can reimagine what some of them might have been used for. Once again, we have this Paleolithic oil lamp from Europe, uh, thousands of years old. And if you look at the shape of it, here we have compared to it a classic Maya ladle sensor from the site of Seren. Now, during the Paleolithic times, as you know, a lot of hunting took place and there would have been many forms of animal fat that you could render for the oil to put in that lamp. And in classic Maya times, uh, there were no domesticated ungulates. You have wild deer, some of which were tamed, but we're not sure about whether there was uh, the kind of oil that would have been necessary to actually fill up a lamp and, or I should say, fill up the sensor and use it as a lamp. So maybe, maybe not. Carl Taub says, um, from actual hearths, three-pronged incensarios probably also indicate the widespread occurrence of three stone hearths by at least late formative times. These sensors function much like portable three stone hearths. So I have this slide in here because the next slide is going to be of the sensors. And if you think about portable illumination and reimagining clay vessels, what they could have been used for, um, this is Carl Taub's take on things. And Carl Taub is an exceptional iconographer at uh, UC Riverside. So um, this is a layout of a patio in Copan in the urban neighborhood of Sapel Taurus. This is a site known as Nine and Eight, and it's called the House of the Pacabs because we know that a scribe lived here. There's an iconography that tells us that. And in one particular patio of this very large household, there were workshops that were found here. And interestingly, in these workshops, in one of them, you have a vessel that was filled with charcoal that is a sensor 
and most likely might have lit up the room in which the person was working. I don't know how familiar, familiar you are with stone buildings of the classic Maya, but they typically did not put windows into their buildings. And if you go into a stone room, it is so dark, even during the day, unless you're near the doorway. But in this case, um, the artist was not near the doorway and the artist was working on manufacturing shell gorgets. So we know that some kind of lighting device existed in this room that was contained within this particular ceramic vessel. Now this is a um, photograph of a Maya bench that's found in nine and eight. This is the main plaza of the House of the Bacabs where the scribe lived. And this is structure 83, the central room here. And in this photo, you see lots of burn marks on the floor. And this is one of the sensors that could have been used to contain the portable hearth as uh, Carl Taub calls it. This is a sensor from Copan. This particular sensor here was not found in the room, but just to give you an idea. So, so far we have lots of evidence for lighting devices among the classic Maya. Mirrors and luminous effects. In many of the kinds of ceramic vessels in these rollout scenes, you have rulers that are pictured with mirrors. Here you have one and here's another one. And then actual mirrors are found. These are made from pyrite, iron oxide, and they're polished to a high degree. This particular mirror, which is 13 inches in diameter, is used um, for many different purposes. And one of the main things that the Maya used mirrors for was not necessarily for dressing or putting in their ear flares, but for divination. And you could see how important divination would be to a classic Maya, Maya ruler if he would be able to foretell the future that is really powerful. And mirrors are found in burial contexts as well as in other kinds of context in the classic Maya realm. So mirrors, the way we use mirrors today is to reflect light. So any kind of light that would have been in the palace would also reflect off of the mirrors and cause various effects, shadows, something that we've already talked about. So featuring the hearth, stationary illumination. Here we have a photograph of a, class, of a Maya woman who is cooking tortillas. And I was fortunate to be able to visit the town of Zinacantan in Chiapas, Mexico. And these were honestly the very best tortillas I have ever tasted in my life. She's cooking them on this huge kamal or griddle. And the hearth is a stationary form of illumination, hence it's a feature rather than an artifact. Now, where do we find households and hearths in Seren? They're actually in lots of places throughout the excavated portions of Seren. Seren. In household three, there is a the remains of a hearth that was found in structure 16. In household two, there's one outside of structure two. And inside the kitchen, structure 11, there is a hearth that was found. And then the feasting center has two hearths on the outside. Now, hearths are not always found inside buildings because of obvious reasons. If you're in a pole and thatch building, you don't want it to burn down. So sometimes hearths would be found outside of buildings. If we look at the Seren kitchen structure 11 of household one, the actual stones of the three stone hearth were found here together. It's highly unusual to recover the stones because people take them with them, they're valuable. And if you have them set up a very particular way, then you don't want to leave them behind. So this is an outline um, of the house, what was actually found. This is a structure that had the doorway here, and then it was made of poles with a thatch roof. And then this is a plan diagram of it showing you where 
the structure falls within relationship to other buildings in this particular household, and then a reconstruction of what the building would have looked like and the woman who's inside cooking. In Copan, I've excavated a lot of structures, a lot of remains of households in rural areas of Copan, and we did not always find the remains of hearths. I already told you that the three stones would be taken away, so what would be left is a pile of ash, and sometimes it's hard to distinguish that ash when you're excavating or it's simply not there anymore. But at one particular site, in the Rio Amarillo area of Copan, we uncovered in structure three, the kitchen, the remains of a hearth. And this was from David Webster's Rural Sites Project from the Pennsylvania State University. But hearths are intricately connected with cooking, obviously, and there are some other symbolic connections with hearths that I'll talk about um, momentarily. But we do find hearths. They're not always necessarily though, obvious. Now, here's the source of light that you might not have considered before. This is a living source of light, bioluminescent fireflies. And in the new world, you have lots of different firefly, firefly species, and most of them fall into the pyrophorus genus. And literally, thousands and thousands of fireflies light up during the night. And this is primarily male fireflies because they are flashing for a mate. So they do this every night in hopes of having sex with some female who comes along and uh, is enchanted by his light. Now fireflies, or as lightning bugs, uh, I grew up calling them lightning bugs since I'm from Pennsylvania. These are pictured on classic Maya vases. Here you have some lightning bugs and you can see them uh, lighting up the area. They're flying away here. And here's another lightning bug that is featured here. And the classic Maya have a firefly glyph called kukai, which is what they called the lightning bug. So there is some evidence that the Maya were certainly aware of lightning bugs. In some cultures, lightning bugs were captured and kept and used as um, a source of light for lighting up a room. There are ethnographic observations from the 1900s, the early 1900s, where people in Mexico were observed to collect lightning bugs and put them in uh, particular kinds of vessels where the light would show through, but we haven't really investigated this. So I cannot tell you for certain whether the classic Maya used lightning bugs as a source of lighting, but there is circumstantial evidence for it. Now, what about the symbolism of illumination among the classic Maya? I've talked about the evidence for it, so we do definitely have evidence for illumination, but what does it mean? Well, light is apotropaic, and that means averting evil influence is best done when a source of light is available to scare off monsters. Light would have been necessary not only to function in the dark, but also to scare off uh, real and fantastical beings. So for example, among the classic Maya, you would have jaguars roaming the landscape at night. This is their home territory. I would not have wanted to go out at night without my torch. You also have fantastical beings that roam the landscape at night. This is part of the mythology. You have what are called Y beings. And sometimes these are thought to be the essences or the souls of people roaming around. You have ancestors out there. So there are lots of things why, lots of reasons why you need to have light at night. The duality of night and day, dark and light is illustrated on this classic Maya plate. Here you have uh, night pictured by the dark and then uh, day pictured by the light. And dualism is something that uh, very much appeals to structuralists and how people think about the world in terms of 
opposites, day, night, dark, light. And this is certainly true for the topic that I am discussing today. Now, um, David Stewart, who is uh, a premier iconographer of the classic Maya, recognized this glyph of Sok. And here you have night and darkness glyph. This is it separately here. And here you have the kin glyph for sun or bright heavens here. And he recognized that this glyph of Sok refers to the fact that you need both day and night to have a completeness, to have order in the world, to make the world whole. So this is one example of this sock, where you have the combination of these glyphs into a combined whole. So that is something that tells us about the importance of night and day and the sun and the bright heavens and the moon to the classic Maya themselves. Now, Andrea Stone and Mark Zender, who wrote a book about uh, Maya art and how to decipher it, uh, have many, many glyphs. And this is the glyph for torch or taj. And Mark Zender says, given that fire played a pivotal role in Maya thought, the torch had complex symbolic dimensions. A torch could stand for solar heat and drought or the light of a firefly. There are lots of Mayan glyphs that relate to light and darkness. You have star, planet, or constellation. You have the sun, the moon. You have caves that are represented here by Mayan glyphs. Fire, fireflies, the torch and spark, mirrors, darkness and night, and then the glyphs for black. So we know that the night was extremely important to the Maya people as well as lighting devices. Now there is a classic Maya sun god and a classic Maya moon goddess. In many cultures around the world who have classic, or I should say, who have sun gods and, and uh, moon gods, goddesses, it's typical for the moon goddess to be female and for the sun god to be male. If you think about the cycle of the moon, it more or less coincides with the human menstrual cycle of women. And we think that's perhaps one very large correlation that occurs with people envisioning the moon as a goddess rather than a god. Now, hunting deer at night was assisted by the moon goddess. Here she is featured on a classic Maya plate, and the moon goddess is astride a deer. And these are the hero twins from the Popol Vuh. Hunapu and Shibalanke, who are hunting deer, and they are aided by the moon goddess. So we know that the moon goddess was important to uh, hunters at night. Before hunters would go out on a hunt, whether it was during the day or the night, they would certainly propitiate the gods before attempting to be successful. David Stewart talks about bloodletting and burning and bloodletting went hand in hand as modes of spiritual and ritual expression. So if you think back to that scene of Lady Shook and taking the thorn lined throat through her tongue and doing some bloodletting and there her husband is holding the torch and then um, the blood lined uh, paper will be burned. This is one reason why this has everything to do with spirituality and ritual expression and then honoring the ancestors as well. Carl Taub talks about hearths. And here is the symbol for hearths. And once again, back to the three stone hearth. As the first central place, the simple three stone hearth may well constitute the original construction of creation. So when someone has a hearth, it's not just about cooking, but you are recreating the universe. So it's extremely important to have a hearth in any kind of household, whether that's in a separate kitchen area or within a house or domicile itself. Carl also talks about sensors. Aside from actual hearths, three-pronged incensarios uh, pictured here, 
probably also indicate widespread occurrence of three stone hearths by at least the late formative times, so thousands of years ago. These sensors function much like portable three stone hearths. So when you light one of these hearths, it can either be the actual three stone hearth or it can be one that is contained within a sensor. When we look at fireflies, Luis Lopez wrote quite a bit about fireflies. He states that there's evidence indicating their association with the underworld, with both classic and post-classic deities, and with several important Maya myths. In particular, fireflies seem to be equated with stars in some of these myths. Significance of studies. The continuous process of manipulation and orchestration of the world by means of light is an active component of social life in every culture. So when we're talking about the past and how people lived, considering illumination is necessary to add another dimension to understanding how ancient life was in the past. Light is an essential component of nocturnal rituals. Here you have from Codex Borbonicus, once again, during colonial times of the Aztec, the new fire ceremony. If you know anything about the new fire ceremony, this had everything to do with a 52 year cycle of uh, ritual calendars that were used in Mesoamerica, also during classic times, as well as Aztec times. And every 52 years, all of the lights in the kingdom would be put out and then for the Aztec, the Aztec priests would go up on a hill, a mountaintop, and in the chest of a sacrificial victim, they would relight the fire and spread it all throughout the kingdom. There's evidence that the classic Maya did the same thing. There's iconographic evidence for Copan, a, a Copan new fire ceremony at structure 33. And this is from Barbara Fash's work. So what you have is Teotihuacan imagery. Once again, if um, I can remind you about the founding, the founding member of Copan was from Teotihuacan. He brought this practice with him so that we know the new fire ceremony was practiced in the classic Maya world, as well as the great uh, classic Maya, I should say the, the classic Teotihuacan central Mexican city. Shadows and rituals, like a beacon highlighting what the viewer should see or should not see. So when we think about shadows and revisit this lintel of Lady Shook and King Shield Jaguar, the shadow is definitely uh, highlighting, the light is highlighting her activity and he is in the foreground there and not the center of the attention as she is. And if you think back to the ceramic vessel that I was talking about and how rulers would use light as a source of power and shadows also as a source of power. So classic Maya illumination types, definitely sunlight and moonlight were natural types. You have portable illumination, torches, ceramic vessels that could function as three stone hearths, Candles, maybe not. Uh, mirrors that were used and features of illumination. Hearts were extremely important, not just for cooking food, but symbolically as the creation of the universe. Living illumination and fireflies. And you can think about what types of light were used for what purposes. Not all of these lights would be used all at the same time in all different kinds of contexts. So there's a real social context to lighting as well that I don't have time to go into this evening, but I just wanted to bring up that question for you to think about. Conclusions. Adding light and darkness, day and night to the past adds a lot to our understanding of people who lived in the past. Power, ethics, morals, and identity are expressed through light. Inequality manifests itself through illumination. 
not only did not everyone have access to all types of lighting, but how you use light to illuminate different people and to cast shadows is powerful. And lights, lightscapes are created for certain purposes. Archaeologists can substantially add to their understandings and reconstructions of the past by considering the 24 hour cycle of human existence, both night and day. So we must consider illumination as part of that equation. Today we have a lumicentric modern world. If you look at, at this um, picture of the earth from uh, satellites, this is a NASA photograph, you can see how much we light up the world. Humans today are affected by light pollution and we do not experience the night. It's really a shame that I would guess that many of you have never seen the Milky Way. If you have the opportunity to see a really dark sky, then please do so. Now, enjoy the full moon on Halloween night tomorrow. Here you have the moon goddess, and here she is riding off toward the moon here with her reindeer that flies in the night, carrying chocolate to all the good little boys and girls. I would like to acknowledge the Archaeological Institute of America, especially Laurel Sparks, the Nadia Borowski Lecture Series for inviting me. I am quite honored to do this lecture on behalf of them. Central Florida Society of the AIA, especially John Walker and Tiffany Early Spadoni, Bridget Kovacevic, Michael Callaghan, and Stacy Barber, the Un University of Central Florida, Bellevue College, um, Entomologist Jason Fuller and Dr. Kavis Winathan and Dr. David M. Reed for constructive feedback. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, so we have a couple of questions that have come up in the chat. Um, I'll, I'll start with my question. <laughs> um, so um, my question is this. Is there any evidence for fire or smoke beacon communication in the Maya sphere? And what about bonfires or other kinds of communal types of celebrations of fire? It's term, in, in terms of evidence, I'm not sure about that, but surely you could see the capabilities for that. If you have torches, then certainly from mountaintop to mountaintop, that would be visible. And mountaintops are something that are sacred all throughout Mesoamerica. If you've never climbed to a mountaintop in Mexico or, or Central American countries, then do so because there are extremely interesting remains up there. And I don't know offhand of any evidence for that. And I'm gonna write that down because I think that should be investigated. I have another question, or there is another question from um, an audience member, and um, this audience member asks, what were they burning? You mentioned animal fat and I think pine. How, how many resources do we know that they use for burning? So essentially, what were these ungents? You know, what kinds of things were they burning? You have something called copal, which is an incense. So C-O-P-A-L uh, comes from a tree. And this is a very fragrant incense that was very much tied up with ritual. And you have uh, this copal incense, which burns, it creates smoke, it creates an atmosphere, it creates coals. And interestingly, I talked to an ethnobotanist and she told me that when you burn copal, it also has properties that uh, scare away the mosquitoes. So it has a practical use as well. So we know that copal was burned. Pine is the favored kind of material for torches uh, because of the resin. There are lots of other kinds of trees that were burned by the classic Maya, but pine was the absolute favorite. And some of you are Mayanists out there. Please feel free to join in because you very well may know more about some of these uh, questions to answer them than I do. Well, well, your response about the anti-mosquito properties of 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 uh, Kupal, um, at, at those 
to those of us in Florida, that that resonates with our experience. So um, we're, we're, we're definitely very interested in that. I might go out and buy some. Um, another question. Buy it yourself. Yeah, exactly. Do a, do a little experimental archaeology and let us know what happens. Right. I, you know, it couldn't hurt, right? Right. Um, so here's another question that we have. You mentioned a book about dancing and kingship among the classic Maya. Would it be possible to get that reference? It is on my bookshelf. I shall be back in one second. The Magic World of Zoom. This is the book I'm talking about by Matt Looper, To Be Like Gods, Dance in Ancient Maya Civilization. So that is the reference. And he also has a more recent book on deer called The Beast Between. And this was an absolutely fascinating read. I really like his work. He's uh, fantastic. So yes, that is the uh, reference for that. Great, we have another question. This one comes from Dr. Allison Hudson. She asks, thanks for a fantastic talk. How Thank does you. the length of nighttime affect a culture's night waves? I thought of this, she says, when you showed the lamp from Greenland, where the length of night can vary dramatically as opposed to Central America and regions closer to the equator. Right, if you think about the length of night, in the equator, you have more or less 12 hours of light, 12 hours of um, night and day, I should say, uh, it's more or less equal. But as you go further north, and especially uh, me being in Seattle, and now that we're heading into winter here, the sun is, uh, you know, in the dead of winter, it comes up at 8 a.m. and then it sets by 4 p.m. And those of you in Florida can imagine how miserable that might be, that you do have different things that people did during the night in different cultures at different latitudes. And in the book that I co-edited, um, This one on the archaeology of the night, there's a chapter in there about the Vikings. So you can look for that chapter, but there are lots of games that people came up with to play at night because it is so dark at night. And if you think about what do you do at night to occupy yourself, especially if you're living in uh, the Arctic, for example, and you want to have some entertainment, there's not much to do. So there's evidence for a lot of games that people created during that time period. And I'm not sure whether I'm answering your question or if it's something more philosophical. Okay. Thank you. We have another question. Um, this, this person asks, having lived off the grid for nearly a decade and for one year with candles only, I find it hard to imagine a workshop without windows. How could they work? Right. Well, that is a question that I ask myself, especially when you go into these Maya palaces and they are dark during the day. So obviously people had to have some kind of lighting inside. And interestingly, if you are a person who is um, working on something, a craftsperson and making something, what has been found is that the residue of what you're working on, say if you're a flint napper, and Ken Hurth has tested this at the site of Xochicalco, that most of the debris from working on Flint takes place, uh, or I should say is found in front of the doorway. Now, how do you survive without any lighting inside those dark, dank buildings? I don't know. Uh, what we should look for is evidence of uh, smut on the roofs, of the stone buildings to see whether torches were there. We need to look also for whether there were like sconces that held different kinds of torches in place. And as far as I know, they have not been noted or recovered or we haven't interpreted them that way. And this is why I think that these little candeleros or these miniature pots might've been used as kind of like a little nightlight, if you will. Neat. We, we have a question from John Walker. He asks, I wonder if the Maya were using fire to do things that take a long time, maybe roasting meat for a long time or firing pottery uh, that oh, would yeah. require tending a fire overnight. Is there any evidence for overnight activities like these? I think there is by 
just just the nature of your question that would make sense that people are doing in the tropics the kinds of activities that are really really hot that you would want to do during the cool of the night lime production for example takes a lot of firewood you might want to do that at night uh, firing pottery um, some of you might be familiar with some ethnographic work on pottery in the Maya region. And uh, I did uh, speak with some people who study current day potters. And they said, as far as they know, most of the firing of pottery takes place during the day rather than night. But we don't know for sure if that happened in the past as well. So I cannot tell you 100 percent but just based on some ethnographic observations. It certainly makes sense to me that if you're living in a tropics and it's 100 degrees that day, that maybe you'll fire those pots at night or maybe you wanna do some other kinds of activities like the roasting at night. And you can uh, make coals and roast a deer, for example, under the ground instead of on top. Right, and in, in fact, one of our uh, questioners asks, um, you, know, you know, we're here in Florida, so the tropics are very much on our mind. Um, it, th this questioner says, it's a lot nicer to walk at night than during the day. So, you know, we wonder if, if travel in certain circumstances, you know, I guess the moon would have, you know, dictated travel, but did, do we have any evidence that travel might have happened at night? We have ethnographic evidence of people traveling at night, but we don't use the moon and we don't see the moon in the modern world like people in the past did. If everything were dark and there's a full moon, you would be able to navigate by it. It is that bright. If you think about uh, people who navigated by the stars, they're in the middle of the ocean. There's enough light to navigate by that. So it is quite possible that people went around the landscape in the dark at night, you would carry your torch, navigate by the moon or the stars. But on the other hand, there were lots of beings that were thought to roam around at night that you don't want to run into. Spirits that could possess you, for example. So you don't want to be alone, especially at night if you're on the landscape. Right, as you were saying, um, you know, there we we don't we don't tend to think about certain activities happening at night. Um, one thing that I remember from the time in which I lived in Switzerland, um, there's a lot less light pollution there, and they would actually organize um, alpine hikes by the light of the moon or snowshoeing by the light of the moon. You know, there's some part of our brain that thinks this is mad; we cannot do this. But in fact, when you go out there with the full moon, you, you can see everything that you need to see. So it really is an education for us about, you know, modernity and the way it conditions, the way we think about lighting. It does. And since we can't see the moon, moonlight, we don't really think about it. Right, exactly. Um, it looks like we have one more question. And this person says, thinking about inequality, do you think that there's a connection between ritual feasting and light? Definitely. If you think about ritual feasting, what that would entail, of course, you have to have the proper dinnerware, of course. You can't just serve on your everyday wear. You must have grandma's fancy uh, wear that is an heirloom to serve dinner on. Think about Thanksgiving dinner. And if you're going to do this at night, you need a lot of light. You need the sources of light. So if you are a ruler, that is not a problem because you might have people bringing in bundles of firewood for you. If you live in rural areas, perhaps you can go and get your own. But if you are living in a suburban area of a classic Maya city, that might be an issue for you. So the number of feasts that you can hold would certainly be an indication of the class you're in or the power that you have or economically how you are you're standing and this is something that we can think about today as well oh it looks like we have uh, another question this one comes from uh, edward gonzalez tenant 
Uh, he says, this is a fascinating topic. Thank you. I'm particularly fascinated by the combination of archaeological and ethno-historical data to illuminate the experiential nature of the past. Pardon the pun. Is light human made and or natural an agent uh, beyond sun and moon gods? Beyond sun and moon gods, is light treated like a living member of the community? Is light invited to participate in culture and society? That's a fascinating question. I love it. Thank you. I, I don't have uh, the definitive answer for you, but if you think about light as living, a fire crackles and seems to take on its own personality depending on the type of firewood that is used. And if you think about agency theory or practice theory, you can figure in the agency of light into this. So part of it is your theoretical orientation and then part of it might be related to, which I think is what you're asking about um, people's own cosmology or mythologies. So I don't have a definitive answer for you, but that is certainly something that I'm going to investigate. Right, this, this actually reminds me of an episode in the book Vibrant Matter um, in which I believe the author's name is Jane Bennett talks about how electricity has agency. And so I think that's a really neat, neat idea that, that mm -hmm. Ed has brought up about, you know, th this idea that the light itself and it's not just the people and this, there, it's this whole conversation. I think that's a really neat idea. Do we have more questions? Okay, it looks like we have um, managed to answer all of the questions this evening. Um, it, are there additional instructions? John, should I turn it over to you for? Um, I don't think so. I don't think we have anything else. Would anyone like to, uh, 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 if anyone else would like to say anything else or uh, otherwise, I think we stand adjourned. I'm sorry that we can't be all get together and have a, uh, a cookie to eat and something to drink, but uh, let's save those warm thoughts and uh, uh, and and uh, we'll be in touch with you by uh, email or on the internet. And uh, and I just want to thank everybody for for making this possible. It's very exciting for us to have this many uh, people come out tonight. So thank you to everybody who came. <laughs>